So here I will show you uh, the process of how I put together my Maya scene to make it um, good for animation, basically. And I followed um, Daniel Fotheringham's blog on this, which uh, is so good, and you should definitely check it out. It's got so much great content, uh, and it basically it, it talks you through like step by step how you can make your shot really good. And I'm just going to do a really short version of that. And so basically, he goes through how to do basic staging, finding reference, and then analyzing it, front foot. So uh, uh, isolating your character so you only see parts of the bodies at, at one time. Um, this helps you focus in on this part of the animation and making that really nice before adding other parts. And then, um, so we already found our reference and then we analyzed our characters. So now we're just gonna go into building our Maya scene and blocking it up. So here I, uh, I'm showing you how the rig is set up. Ashish Sharma, that's uh, whose uh, animation I'm using for this. Um, here, this is a walk cycle by Ashish, and uh, here I'm just showing how the rig is set up and how the controls are represented in the graph editor. So for the chest and the hips, they are, obviously they are in, um, they are relative to this middle COG control. So when you move the COG, you'll see that it's actually walking through space, but you cannot see this in the hips and, uh, and the chest controls, which is a little bit hard for me, at least, to understand where my character is moving in space. So what I find really helpful is to parent these two controls to objects or locators so that they move separately and they actually move or they're represented to be moving through 3D space in the graph editor. So I'll show you what I mean by that. So here you can see how all the um, rotations and all the translations are completely different from what we're used to. So translation Y, obviously, we think it's up and down. But um, for this creature, because it's relative to the COG, it will be forwards and backwards. So it's a little bit like confusing. So what um, is good to do is to parent things. So here I'll show you, um, for example, um, how you can parent uh, a cube, for example, I, I used a cube because um, it just helps with showing the rotation of your chest and hips so you can see where the shoulders are going. And you can also see if it's doing any strange gimbling issues. So um, you can like see me struggle through this. I know there's much better ways of um, doing this quickly. Um, I'll still have to use, learn to use the Maya tools. Um, so basically you just parent it and then bake it out, and then you parent the control to this baked out locator or object, and then you'll have much cleaner curves in the end that will represent what your character is doing, which I'll show you later on. So what I find is important is to set your rotation order to ZYX, because um, sometimes, not sure if you, uh, have this as well, but sometimes the curves kind of mimic each other in the rotations and it's kind of annoying because you can't figure out uh, what is doing what because these two kind of do the same thing. And then when you're trying to correct some issue, it might make more gimbling. So gimbling is when you have like crazy rotations, which I think I'll show you next. Like when I just delete these few curves, then the, like the body does some crazy stuff that you obviously don't want and it's hard to fix it. Especially because these two curves are working basically exactly against each other. So if you just change the rotation order, um, it'll help sometimes with um, these gimbling issues. Sometimes you have to bake them out and then change the rotation order again and then bake them out again. It's a little bit complicated. But basically here I'm showing how you can change the rotation order. So you just go into your object and then you go into your uh, attribute editor, change the rotation order. You can reparent it, rebake it out and then parent the con controller to this object, and then it'll give you a lot cleaner curves. So I'm just uh, doing that. And then here you can see how the representation in the graph editor for the chest is exactly what you see in space. So you can see that translate Z, it's actually moving through space. So that's really good to know. And then translate Y is actually moving up and down. So you can, it's much easier to correct like your um, ups and down poses with this. 
And then obviously the translate X is going um, sideways and the rotations are also acting exactly how you would expect them to act. And this is just really, I think, good setup. Um, obviously, you can do it other ways as well. You can also start by animating the COG and then baking them out, or like however you work best. I just thought that this was a great tip from Daniel and from Eddie to help separate the hips and the chest to make a really fluid movement and make it really um, like dynamic, I guess. So here is just another. Alicia, yeah. can I read oh, out yeah. some questions to you? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, before we go on, I think this yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, are there any tips on animating stylized uh, big bad creatures? Um, I guess probably made up creatures. I'm guessing. Is that right? Yeah, I'm guess I'm guessing like uh, giant large creatures. Like yeah. There, something of that scale. Even dinosaurs, like you yeah, know, right. Yeah, I, I definitely think, um, so even if they're made up, it's, I think it's great to look at reference. So um, you want to see how your, your creature is physically built. So does it have a really big uh, upper body or a lower body? And then that's where your weight is going to be. And then that's where you're going to want to try to balance your creature. And then for dinosaurs, this was actually a great webinar you had before, uh, uh, someone who was doing um, freelance dinosaurs and they brought up a really great point that um, oftentimes when we see in the movies is we see dinosaurs with their legs kind of bent and then they're roaring but there's not actually a lot or any um, uh, reptiles that roar so scientists think that they didn't really roar they might have made like a low growling sound but not really a roar and they would most likely have walked on straighter legs like elephants but obviously that's not something we're used to. So it's just good to know these kind of reference things, I think. And then um, for like more stylized creatures for like more cartoony stuff, I guess, I think it's good to um, uh, look at, again, look at reference, but also look at um, what kind of environment is your character in? So is it really, uh, is it still on this planet kind of with the same kind of physical laws like gravity and stuff? And that's all stuff that you can add into your animations and make it still look really heavy. Or if it's really small, make it look extremely light and playful. I think, I think that's, uh, I don't have a lot of experience with that. So maybe Eddie, you can actually give some better advice. But that's what I have to yeah, say. That's, uh, that's, um, I guess that's what you, you kind of do is you, you source different and similar animals um, mm -hmm. and you kind of, make it appealing like again like you're bringing up dinosaurs um because they're kind of like birds they would have walked with straight leg mm. um, that's yeah yeah appealing in film so you kind mm -hmm. of blend that in with say a quadruped where they have nice you know z shapes on their back yeah and just a nice weight on the elbow but in reality if they weigh i don't know 20 tons or whatever they just gonna mm -hmm. collapse if they're gonna rely on their upper legs to hold them up which is why they have straight legs. Right, so, totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that just becomes a, um, a thing where you just design how they mm -hmm. would pose and look according to what you like as well. Um, so another question for you. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we have Daniel Fotheringham doing a webinar for us. In, oh, no way. Uh, probably next month or Yes. After, but I am definitely yeah. joining that one. He, he's a mate of mine, so I managed to... Kind of into coming on. Coming yes, on. <laughs> good job. Um, so, which method do you use for creature progressive cycles? Oh, what does that mean? Like, um, thinking, um, your method is just the just the way you went over, like finding references and then blocking it out and step keys and then. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, I'll also go into more detail on exactly the process of the shot. So now I'm just doing like before the shot, how I set up my rig and stuff. So my process, I guess, would be to uh, set up the rig so that it's easy for me personally to understand what's going on. Because I like to see in the graph, I like to see the representation uh, of what is going on in um, 3D space, instead of having to like battle two graphs at the same time that are doing the opposite thing and stuff. Does that kind of answer the question? Oh, yeah, it does. 
Definitely. Okay, cool. Uh, and where do you find um, reference? Oh, that's a good one. So um, mostly I find it in, on YouTube or on Google Images. The easiest way for me is to go onto YouTube and just type in what I want to find. So if I want to find a tiger jumping, I just search for a tiger jumping. And sometimes you can't find the exact thing you want um, because there's a limit sometimes to the creature you're trying to animate. Like tigers aren't, they're endangered. So there's not tons of reference of wild tigers out there, but um, you can always source from similar animals and then like adjust the weight and the anatomy to the creature you're animating. So I took a lot of random references from dogs and stuff who are doing athletic things and I just try to scale it up and make it more cat-like. Um, so as you saw in the reference, the dog, they move their heads a lot and um, cats just don't move their head a lot. And then obviously dogs' feet placement is different. So I'll adjust that to what a cat would do. And that's basically um, how I stitch together my reference. And I also like to, this is one thing I learned that was really helpful during the course as well, is to really find reference for every bit and piece of animation I'm doing because um, sometimes I can visualize it in my head but it just won't come across or the weight isn't quite right something's wrong and as soon as you find reference there's like a whole new world has opened of uh, opportunity because the reference will show you things that you never would have thought of and it'll show you the correct weight spacing timing of everything that is moving um, if that helps yeah that's great Cool. I think you answered um, Tao's question, which was when you were gathering your references from different size cats, how did you account for how the different weights and how yeah, that yeah. affects how you uh, how your model moved? So I think totally. you'd answer that one. Uh, let's do one last question. Is using yeah. faster control bad for the movement in, in Z, Z axis? Yeah, I'm guessing like it's just a different way of. Totally, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, yeah. I think it's. um totally depending on what your style of animation is or how you approach or how you understand it best. For me, it was just easier this way because I could see the hips, chest and head separately um, just because that was easy for me. But obviously there's, you can make the same quality of stuff using a completely different method as well. So I think if it works best for you personally to use the main control, to block it out or to even do the whole animation it's that's totally cool <laughs> oh yeah thanks i'll let you push Sweet. on with your presentation okay no problem thanks, just sir. let me know if there's anything that you want me to go more in depth or if anything is too dry i can definitely skip stuff oh no nah, everything's great everything's oh cool. cool so here's just like a um, quick overview or like summary of uh daniel's blog as well so for me, it was important to represent the curves accurately in the graph, so that's what we, did, what we did. And then also something he talks about is isolating the creature, as I said before. So um, you would do the head and chest first, then you'd do the front legs and animate it as a biped, and then you would add the hind legs in. You can just block them in to be the same as your front legs, but offset by half a cycle. And that gives you a very like ballpark correct kind of movement for your quadruped. Um, and the one thing I heard, I think Eddie told me and also other people told me before was that it doesn't have to be 100% realistic, but it needs to be 100% believable. So sometimes you'll look at reference and it looks completely crazy or weird when you put it into 3D and it just doesn't look right. Then I feel like for me, you can definitely, or I can definitely like change it to make it look more believable or more something that I don't think is CG. So sometimes when you look at cats' tails, they act really strangely or they're really stiff and it just doesn't look real, especially when you put it into 3D, then it's not believable at all. And then so I took a lot of liberties with the tail. It's a lot of like overlapping, a lot of flowy motions that you can't really see in the reference. But like in other things too, you can, uh, you can exaggerate some things um, just to make it more... Um, like clear what you're trying to animate, I guess. Of course you can, this is all just my opinion. You can uh, have your own opinion as well. And then I think it's also important to keep the creature on model. So this is one thing that Eddie was going back to in the class often. So 
uh, you can push the poses or I push the poses a lot, but sometimes they went out of proportion or like that's not something I could find in a reference that a cat would actually do. So um, it's good to find references for poses you want to have or you want to hit and then um, uh, try to match that in your 3D and try to keep it on model so that your creature stays believable in the environment so that it doesn't like so you're not stretching it too far, you're not compressing it too much, not getting strange angles in the neck, for example. Like that's something that was really important to me. And then <laughs> this is my mini journey from becoming a beginner to not so beginner anymore. <laughs>